everyone, and welcome to our video on macromolecules for AP Biology. In this video, we're going to talk about how the structure and the subunits of a particular polymer could lead to changes in the structure or function of the macromolecule. Some of this may be review, but hopefully it will help you support your AP Biology classroom. Now, a key idea in AP Biology is that structure is going to help dictate function. And so in AP Bio, we're going to talk specifically about how the subunits of all of our big macromolecules, our organic compounds, are going to be composed to make those larger macromolecules and help them do the jobs that they need to do within cells, within the body, within a larger organism. So for example, for talking about how structure dictates function, if you're looking at an enzyme, which is what we're seeing here, the active site is very particular to the particular reaction that the enzyme is going to be able to undergo or help other molecules undergo. If the structure of this active site is changed, the molecule can no longer fit with its substrate. Or for example, if the active site is blocked by a particular ligand, um, something that is a competitive inhibitor for an enzyme, then it may not be able to do the job that it needs to do. If the enzyme unfolds or denatures, it also loses that active site's shape and then can no longer link up with the substrate for its reaction. So all of biology, we want to think about how the structure of a particular molecule is going to help it get the job done that it needs to do. When we talk about all of these macromolecules, a lot of them are synthesized, meaning we create them in the body with particular reactions, but some of them are consumed as well, and so some of them are broken down from other larger macromolecules, other organic compounds. I'm going to use those two terms interchangeably in this video, and a lot of that comes from the food that we eat. So think about, as we're going through these organic compounds or macromolecule categories, what are good sources of them in the foods that we consume? So our four main categories you might have remembered from regular biology are going to be nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. When we talk about the structure of nucleic acids, we're going to break it down to a nucleotide, which we'll talk about in this video a little bit, as well as in another video on nucleic acids specifically. But these nucleotides are going to, are going to make up the structure of DNA and how we have our genetic code. Proteins themselves, their monomers are amino acids, and it's really important to talk about how the amino acids are, themselves are structured and so how the proteins are built in these long amino acid chains, which we'll talk about in this video. Carbohydrates are going to be made of monosaccharides, so these simple sugars that can be circular or linear and then, then linked up to form polysaccharides, depending on what the needs are for that molecule or the situation. And lipids as well are long changed. These are nonpolar macromolecules, and the differences in saturation are going to determine the structure and function of lipids. And we'll talk about phospholipids in this video as well. So we're going to break down some examples from each of these four categories, but remember to refer back to your text or other resources if you need more background on any that we anything that we discuss in this video. So our monosaccharides, these are the monomers of our carbohydrates. Now, monosaccharides are generally categorized on where their carbonyl group is, and if you need to go back and review our functional groups video, please do that. So where their carbonyl group is, and then the number of carbons in their backbone. So we have a lot of different categories of monosaccharides. These are riboses uh, in this video, and riboses are going to be pentose sugars, pent meaning five, and the pentose sugar is going to have our five carbon atoms can be either uh, in that circular shape or linear, depending on the situation. Again, the five carbon sugars, ribose and deoxyribose is shown in this. This is in a different language, but it's still the same molecule. Um, they're really important components of our nucleotides found in RNA ribose sugars and deoxyribose found in DNA. Taking a look at the monomer of proteins, these are amino acids. So peptides of proteins are polymers, so larger molecules, poly meaning many, mer meaning a unit, of amino acid monomers. So amino acids are the monomers of our proteins, and we have them arranged in a linear sequence. And we have a side chain here that's going to determine the properties of this amino acid. And this can make the amino acid nonpolar or charged. And depending on its properties, the molecule is going to arrange itself in a particular way to provide a different structure in the protein. Because we have them arranged in this linear sequence, that our side chain is going to be really important in determining the structure of the overall protein. So these are a bunch of amino acids represented by circles linked up together. And this is our primary structure of our protein. And when we form a peptide bond, meaning a link between two amino acids, that's going to be a dehydration synthesis reaction, meaning that when these two molecules link up, a molecule of water is released. And it may seem like each of these individual 
amino acids isn't very important, but in fact, there are several diseases we're going to talk about in this class. For example, sickle cell anemia, where there's just one substitution or one difference in one of the amino acids, and then the entire molecule is changed. So in sickle cell anemia, we have a very particular structural change of hemoglobin, which is our protein, and a glutamate amino acid is replaced by a valine, and that leads to changes in the entire organism and all of the symptoms of sickle cell anemia. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to genetic and evolution. Looking back at our singular amino acid, the chains that are going to be formed are on the growing carboxyl end, and they're going to form covalent bonds at the carboxyl terminus or end of our growing peptide chain. Again, the sequence of amino acids determines the primary structure, and then smaller folds are going to make up the secondary structure. So these are what we call local fold folding of the amino acid chain to make structures like alpha helices, as you he see here, and beta pleated sheets. Our tertiary structure is the full 3D structure of the protein, so made up of these local folds put together. And generally, this is going to form in the most energetically conservative way possible, minimizing any extraneous structures or free energy losses. Now, a quaternary structure of a protein involves several different protein subunits. These are different monomers of different polypeptide units. And overall, the structure of our primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary folds of our protein is going to determine the overall overall function of that protein. If there is a substitution or a change in any one of these structures, we could have a different function or something wrong with that protein, possibly leading to illness or even death of an organism. Let's talk about DNA very briefly, but we're going to have a whole other video on nucleic acids. So in DNA, our monomers are nucleotide here, which is made up of a phosphate, our sugar in DNA, that's deoxyribose, and then our base, which in DNA is A, T, G, or C. Now these A's and T's and G's and C's are linked up by hydrogen bonds in the center of that DNA molecule. Adenine and thymine joined together by two hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine are joined together by three hydrogen bonds. And our phosphate backbone here is on the outside, the bases are on the inside. Now what's really cool about DNA is that it has directionality, meaning that we have the molecule running in opposite 5 prime to 3 prime orientations. So at one end of the molecule, we have a 5 prime carbon on this side, and then on the other end of the molecule, we have our 3 prime carbon. And those prime numbers, those are going to go with the labels of the carbon within that deoxyribose sugar. And this directionality is going to be important when we talk about the growing ends of a DNA molecule in replication or in protein synthesis when we're talking about building on more nucleotides for transcription. So let's talk about lipids really briefly. Lipids are present everywhere. Sometimes we leave them out because they don't sound as cool as proteins or DNA. But we have lipids within aquatic mammals to help with energy storage, heat retention, like this river otter, um, in order to protect them from the elements. Also, the waxy lay in the waxy cuticle of many plants is made up of a lipid layer. One of the most important functions of lipids we have is our phospholipid bilayer that surrounds every cell. So this makes up the membrane of cells. A phospholipid is made up of a phosphate group, so this is a pol polar head of the molecule. And then there's these two tails, which create the hydrophobic portion of the molecule. And the way the phospholipid bilayer works is that the hydrophilic heads are arranged on the outside, the hydrophobic tails are arranged on the inside, and then this entire layer surrounds a cell. So hydrophilic head groups are facing an aqueous solution, and the tails are inside. They're protected in the middle of this bilayer. And this phospholipid membrane structure surrounds all cells. We'll talk more about this when we get to cell transport and different proteins that are going to help us out, especially with cell signaling. But make sure you keep these monomers and the structure of these organic compounds in mind when we start talking about the reactions. We're going to come back to this a lot throughout the year, so make sure you've reviewed this video thoroughly. Thanks, everyone.